Well, good afternoon, everybody, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this important event um, sponsored uh, by the Parliament and by the Euro European Union Centre for Studies at the ANU. Uh, and it is a, a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, someone who I've come to know um, well, relatively well in the short time that we've known each other, the Speaker of the uh, House of Commons in the United Kingdom, uh, the Right Honourable John Burko MP, uh, Speaker of the House of Commons, as I said, for the uh, United Kingdom. Um, he has a very distinguished uh, background. Uh, he graduated from the University of Essex with first class honours in government. He's had a distinguished career in the Conservative Party, ranging from the National Chairman of the Federation of Conservative Students in 1987, serving as a councillor in the London Borough of Lambeth, special advisor to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, became the member for Buckingham in 1997, held many shadow front bench positions, ranging from education to shadow Secretary of State for International Development. He served on a wide ranging number of committees of the House, and in 2009, he became the Speaker of the House of Commons. Now, I must say, for me, that posed a very interesting question. Since 1377, when we had the first Speaker uh, by that title um, appointed, he's only the 157th Speaker. On the other hand, since 1901, I am the 29th Speaker. It says something about the stability, I think, of the House of Commons. Uh, but I must say, uh, the speaker was telling me that uh, in past times, people had served for up to 35 years. Uh, he tells me he doesn't want to do 35 years, but he's quite anxious to do some more. <laughs> Can I also uh, uh, welcome the um, British High Commissioner? Delighted to see you with us. Uh, I think. The difference between our two houses uh, has become apparent in a number of ways, in that over that period of time, uh, since the first speaker was appointed, and I do see the, our clerk here, and he was appointed just a bit before the first speaker, so that office is actually a bit, uh, a bit older. But not to put too fine a point on it, the reason the clerk was called the clerk was he was probably the only person who could read and write. And he had to tell the rest of them what was going on. Now, of course, we have a, well, I think we've got a literate lot. <laughs> uh, so the rules for our operating uh, is uh, quite different. Um, John is definitely Westminster. And here, the way we have gone in Australia and developed things our own way, I'm Osminster. We used to talk about Washminster, but that doesn't accurately define us anymore. We're Osminster, and it's my word for the year. I want to see it in the diary, so in the dictionary at some stage. But the importance of tonight is that we're going to hear um, from the speaker, and he'll address us on some of the challenges faced by modern parliaments with technology that could not even have been imagined 50 years ago, let alone in 1377. Speaker Burko will talk to us about the work of the Speaker's Commission on Digital Democracy, which he established, and how that work can enhance the ability of parliament to engage better with their citizens, and whether it will change the way in which we operate. And so, it is my great pleasure to introduce and ask to speak to us uh, the Right Honourable, the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burko, MP. Well, Madam Speaker, thank you for the characteristic warmth and generosity of that introduction, to which I don't know that I'm entirely equal, but I am bound to say without fear of contradiction and for the avoidance of doubt, that having heard myself introduced, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> Whether you'll feel the same way at the end of my remarks is, of course, a matter for perfectly legitimate speculation and conjecture. But I want to say a number of things at the outset before I proceed to my principal thrust. First, it's a privilege to be here in Australia for the first time 
but what I hope you won't judge from experience at the end of this meeting should also be the last. It's a privilege because of the historic ties, the cultural affinities that bind us, and it's also a very personal pleasure because I have, in recent times, come to know Speaker Bishop. I have the great privilege of welcoming Madam Speaker to Speaker's House in Westminster earlier this year. And, of course, in such circumstances, we share experiences and testimonies. We feel that we have much in common with, but can learn new things from each other. And from my point of view, it's a joy, an absolute joy, to be here. The second thing I'd like to do is to treat of one quite sensitive matter, which even as straight-talking Australians, I hazard a guess your natural courtesy will disincline you to raise with me directly, but which, if unaddressed, will lurk mischievously and perhaps from my vantage point perilously in the undergrowth, and which I judge, therefore, should be knocked on the head at the outset. And that is the sensitive matter of height. <laughs> Very specifically, it has been bruited in some of the more down-market parts of the British press that I am the shortest man ever to be speaker. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's quite difficult to make an assessment of this matter so far as my audience is concerned, because you yourselves are, of course, sitting down. But in the fairly confident expectation that there are some people who, like me, are vertically challenged in this audience, I say very, very explicitly, there's nothing wrong with being short. We short people should stick together. We may be short, but we may also be judged to be perfectly formed. In any case, facts are facts, and I am short. I'm 51 years old and remain short, and given the known impact of the aging process upon physiognomy, the overwhelming likelihood is that I shall become inexorably and irrevocably shorter still. <laughs> and about the fact of that continued and soon to be exacerbated shortness, I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I'm as intensely relaxed as Peter Mandelson, a controversial British politician in the Blair era, once famously said, shocking his party by so doing, that New Labour was intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich. Well, I'm intensely relaxed about my shortness, but I'm not intensely relaxed about the matter of historical accuracy. And you would expect the speaker, forsooth, to have done his research. And if in no other respect, I hope in that respect, that I shall not disappoint you. I have done my research, just as Madam Speaker showed that she had very attentively done hers in readiness for today. And simply as a matter of historical fact, it's quite wrong when some of these more down-market scribblers say, oh, well, Burko's the shortest man ever to be Speaker. Sir John Bussey, Speaker of the House of Commons, from 1394 to 1398, Sir John Wenlock, Speaker of the House of Commons from 1455 to 1456, and Sir Thomas Tresham, we mustn't forget him, Speaker of the House in 1459, are all believed to have been shorter than I am, although I do have to admit that this was true only after all three of them had been beheaded. <laughs> Indeed, no fewer than seven of my predecessors met their end on the executioner's table. One was killed in battle, and a further poor unfortunate soul was brutally murdered. So you will understand that this does enable me to view the present woes and challenges which afflict and confront the House of Commons, and sometimes even afflict and confront me with an appropriate sense of historical perspective. That is to say, ladies and gentlemen, whatever else happens to me, I am not likely to lose my head. And it is, as I repeat, a joy to be amongst your number. The other point that I would like to make at the outset is a point that I made to Carol Mills, and it's good to see Carol coming into the room now when I met her back in the end of July in London, and that is that I am a huge sports fan. I'm not myself a devotee of cricket, and I'm sorry to disappoint people who are. I absolutely understand why people are thrilled by that sport, but it's not part of my background or 
family lineage at all. But I am a huge tennis fan, and secondly, and not insignificantly a big football fan, but I am above all a fanatical tennis fan. And I've always admired some of the great Australian competitors. It is joy upon joy for me in the course of this visit to be set to meet John Alexander, now a member of parliament here, and a very, very great player in his day, ranked at one time number eight in the world, a formidable competitor whom I enjoyed watching in person at Wimbledon and on my television screen, but whom I've never had the privilege of meeting. I gather I'm going to be able to remedy that deficiency today. And if you think today, you think in the women's game of Sam Stozer and on the men's side, Leighton Hewitt and Nick Kyrgios, who's the new rising star of Australian tennis, but I hope you'll forgive me taking a slightly nostalgic view and saying that amongst the great female stars of Australian tennis, I always think of Margaret Court, who's one of the most outstanding tennis players of all time in the women's game with a phenomenal trophy collection. And another great champion in the women's game and probably one of the most popular women ever to play at Wimbledon was Yvonne Goulagon, who of course subsequently became Yvonne Cawley. And on the men's side, my two absolute heroes are Rod Laver and Ken Rosewall. And I saw earlier the Rod Laver arena. Rod Laver, the only man to win the Grand Slam twice. Nobody has done it since. In fact, nobody has won the Grand Slam in a calendar year since Rod Laver did it in 69. And Ken Rosewall, eight times Grand Slam title winner, and a finalist at Wimbledon four times, sadly, the losing finalist four times, but four times from 1954 to 1974. So in terms, not just of his title wins, but of his longevity at the top of the game, Rosewall was quite an extraordinary phenomenon. All a diversion, I know, from politics, but it's always said that we politicians have a very limited hinterland, and I don't claim to be a great intellectual. I have a vast array of interests in the way that some people can claim, but I love my sport, and there is nothing more stimulating, in my view, than watching the great practitioners demonstrate their craft. Ladies and gentlemen, I said what a joy it is to be here and to see in person a parliament which I have for so long admired from such a long distance. Although my words today are described as a lecture, I am here, frankly, also to listen and to learn. So I should rather think of what I have to say to you today as being the start of a discussion. My remarks will center on the question of representative democracy in the digital age and the challenges that this creates for modern democratic institutions of all forms, but for legislatures more than most. I certainly don't have all the answers. I might have, perhaps, some of the questions. Before taking that as my central theme, however, I just want to say something about this location. The Westminster Parliament is indeed an ancient one. We will be celebrating our 750th birthday next year at the same time as the celebrations of the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. That long history has often led us as well as others to refer to ourselves as the mother of parliaments. Colleagues, while this is true in one sense, I can also myself understand why that phrase might be somewhat irritating to those parliaments which by implication are cast as the children. After all, many of these so-called infants have proved somewhat more mature than their parent. Australia, for example, had universal male suffrage before the United Kingdom did. It introduced votes for women before we did. It pioneered innovations such as the secret ballot, the non-partisan ballot paper, and the postal vote before we did. Your rules around party funding and party registration arrived 15 years before we enacted them. I can see, therefore, that the tone of all these Mother of Parliament references over the decades must be somewhat tiresome for Canberra, as indeed it may be for Ottawa and Wellington. The mother-in-law of parliaments might seem to you to be a more accurate description of the relationship, although I would like to stress for the record that my own mother-in-law is, of course, a wonderful woman. <laughs> as is by now well known, I am an enthusiast for how this parliament conducts its business in the chamber and how more widely the parliamentary estate is run. I hope to acquire more knowledge in this regard 
There is nevertheless perhaps one area of your political culture here which is fascinating, but which I perhaps might not be inclined to explore as deeply. As some of you may know, and others almost certainly won't, one of my personal crusades is a drive to civilize our own Prime Minister's question time. You will forgive me, I do hope, and in particular I hope Madam Speaker, a formidable disciplinarian we know, will forgive me, I hope, if I admit that this is not a campaign in which I am looking for an Australian export to the House of Commons. We live in an age of scepticism, indeed of cynicism, about politics, politicians and political institutions. Australia is slightly protected from this in that compulsory voting here means that this era of mistrust cannot manifest itself in the form of disturbingly low turnouts in elections, levels of participation which dilute the so-called mandate from those outcomes and bring democracy itself into disrepute. Yet, in most other regards, the corrosive charges that politicians are all the same, that they're in it for themselves, that there's a political class which is a caste apart from conventional citizens, that we're arrogant, remote and unaccountable, conducting our own business in our own language without much interest in the opinions of others outside of our own ranks, are all charges which I suspect are as prevalent in Brisbane Melbourne and Sydney, as they are in Birmingham, Manchester and Southampton. We should not overstate the notion of a golden age in which politicians and public were fused as one. Frankly, such a golden age did not exist, and where it came close to doing so, this was almost certainly due to a form of deference which has disappeared and whose loss, if we are candid about it, is not to be lamented. That said, representative democracy as a concept does not command the consensus that it once enjoyed. Many electors are unconvinced that the representative part of it is still relevant to them. As a consequence, colleagues, the democracy element comes dangerously close to being little more than the act of casting a ballot in national elections once every three years here or five years in the United Kingdom. This sense of a distance within democracy stands in contrast to so much else in modern civilization. The principal impact of the technological revolution which we have witnessed over the past 20 years has actually been to bring people closer together and in new ways to enable them more closely to interact with each other. The internet, the smartphone, Facebook, Twitter, and numerous other more specialist social media mean that in business, the whole nature of creating a company, of funding it, of growing it, and of establishing a market domestically and internationally for it, has been utterly transformed. For individuals, it means the capacity to invent or to become part of vast new invisible communities online through shared interests in whatever it might be. Technological change has, in a small d sense of the word, massively enhanced our democracy in that it has allowed multiple conversations and exchanges to take place, which, for reasons of practicality, were virtually impossible beforehand. And this is a technological revolution with little in the way of hierarchy, rules, or barriers to entry. It is the Wild West without the shooting. It is a truly extraordinary situation through which to be living. 10 years ago, September 2004, in Britain at least, a blackberry was still a fruit. An android existed only in science fiction films. There was no Facebook as such, no tweets had been sent, and the iPad was an unknown instrument. A decade later, and many people could not live without all of these innovations. Yet has representative democracy been as altered by the digital age as it should have been? I think the only honest answer at present is no. We have all adapted to this whirlwind, of course, via new websites, Facebook pages, and Twitter streams. But if we are candid, we have largely been reactive. 
on the whole, we have not been on the front foot about anticipating how we could adapt, not merely the information which we as a legislature place in the public domain, but the fundamental nature of our engagement with the public as well. Some of our colleagues have, in fairness, been closer to this ideal than others. Estonia, for example, moved towards internet voting much faster than elsewhere. Brazil, Chile and El Salvador have been pioneers in opening their parliamentary procedures up online. China, somewhat unexpectedly, has also been ahead of the crowd, allowing internet public comment on all draft legislation since 2007, which puts plenty of European parliaments, frankly, to shame. But the pace of technological change means that even the best are running fast just to stand still. A more fundamental assessment of what the term representative democracy means in the digital age has still to be contemplated. After all, the historic notions of representative democracy and parliamentary democracies were the belated byproducts of the Industrial Revolution. They will have to evolve, perhaps to evolve radically to meet the internet revolution, or they will be left redundant by it. It is precisely because of this that late last year I launched the House of Commons' own Digital Democracy Commission with the task of producing its report by January of 2015. The timing is quite deliberate in that I want the 750th birthday of the House of Commons to be an occasion for looking forward as much as, if not more than, looking back. I love history, but I do not want to wallow in it. I do not think that there has been an exercise quite like this undertaken anywhere in the democratic world, and we've set ourselves some almost reckless ambitions. Yet I am convinced that a brave and bold Big Bang approach such as this is required if we are to secure something more audacious than sharper websites, a funkier Facebook site, or identification of what will be the next Twitter. We want to be able to divine what it is that an increasingly technologically adept electorate will want and expect from their parliament and their politics in 2020, 2025, 2030 and beyond, and then decide how to overhaul our own arrangements to meet those entirely legitimate demands of us. I'm pleased to report that the Digital Democracy Commission has been received with enthusiasm and has not been short of submissions and suggestions on its subject. It's worth reciting a few statistics to illustrate the extent of its engagement on this issue so far. To date, we have held 17 roundtable discussion forums, with more still planned, participated at conferences, held an internal digital marketplace to gather ideas from the professional staff in Parliament, reached out to colleagues across the world to learn from best practice beyond the shores of the UK, received hundreds of unsolicited emails and phone calls from the public, and interested organisations, encouraged others to open source their evidence, conducted face-to-face -face meetings with over 100 different experts, and of course enjoyed countless conversations via social media, resulting in currently having 1,799 Twitter followers in 48 different countries. We tweet, I am advised, approximately, I do like this, 5.74 times a day. I emphasise not 5.73 or 5.75. In addition, I've written to the Vice-Chancellor of every university in the UK. So far, this has resulted in 31 replies with offers of help, ideas and further contact with academics at the cutting edge of their specialisms. We've run an online forum for politics students from nine universities from across each nation in the UK, considering five separate themes, the results of which have been published on our web pages, pages that have been viewed so far by at least an estimated 25,000 people. That five-fold brief of the Digital Democracy Commission is to consider how, through the effective embrace of technology, we as parliamentarians can legislate better, how we can scrutinize better, how we can represent better, how we can engage better, and how we can enable civil society itself to engage with each other better. 
We have considered and we continue to look at what public participation means with a wide range of people and organisations from the tech world and businesses to charities and civil society. Some of our evidence gathering meetings have been live streamed and are open to the public. Even our terms of reference were openly and publicly sourced. We are in a sense operating on the principle that the method is the message and so much of the evidence is being taken online. We are operating within existing resources, so we're not spending vast sums of money on this initiative. And we are very much up for hearing what people have to say to us within that very broad five-fold remit that I've just articulated to you. Inevitably, some issues tend to attract more comment than others. And it is certainly true that we are looking at the question of whether it would make sense to move to electronic voting within Parliament, not something for me to decide, still less to seek to impose, but something for Parliament to decide. Seems not unreasonable in that context to ask the people who pay our wages, what do you think? Would it be better? Would it be more efficient? Would it be more acceptable to you if we voted in that way? And secondly, we are asking people for their views on whether it would be sensible to introduce online voting in elections, as I've referenced a number of countries which appear successfully to have done so. Once again, not for me to prescribe, nor even for the Commission to seek to prescribe or to impose. It is, I think, for us to initiate and seek to nurture a debate in which different views can be heard. In all that we do in this crusade, and it is in a sense a crusade, however, we need to remember that representative democracy has to be about the maximum level of inclusion if it is to live up to its name. There is the risk that rapid technological change leaves large numbers of people behind. We need to ensure that there is a democratization of data or else in effect we will risk going back to a politics of the property qualification with intellectual property rather than physical property, the new source of the franchise. That obviously would be a disaster and against that we must guard and protect ourselves. Let me just set out why I'm issuing this warning. When I was a teenager, colleagues in Britain, in the 1970s and early 1980s, pretty much every household had a daily newspaper of one form or another. And the vast majority of households watched news broadcasts several nights of the week. There was not an absolute equality of information, but the amount of common and shared information about public matters was relatively extensive. I would assume, you'll advise me if I'm wrong, that much the same was probably the case in Australia as well. In contemporary Britain, and possibly in Australia too, an increasing inequality of information is occurring. The true enthusiast for news can find more of it more easily and at faster speed than at any time in human history. Such an enthusiast can perform the equivalent of reading 20 newspapers and watching 30 news broadcasts, if not more. He or she can rightly be described as super-informed. Other adults, perhaps of the older generation mostly, but not exclusively, still consume news much as they did in the 1970s. They might be labelled as standard informed. But there are also adults who virtually never read a national newspaper and have many alternative avenues for viewing television than 24-hour news. There is the clear danger that they become the sub-informed and thereby divorced from our democracy. Technology did not, in any malevolent sense, create this divide amongst the population. After all, the technology itself is morally neutral. It is a question of the way in which it is used that counts. But as we respond to technology in our politics and in our parliaments, we have to avoid elitism and exclusion. A democratic voyage that went from ancient Greeks to contemporary geeks would not be a triumph. So of all the many submissions which the Digital Democracy Commission has received in recent months, there is one comparatively simple observation which has stuck in my mind. It is from Valerie Thompson, the Chief Executive of the UK e-Learning Foundation. Valerie contends that, and I quote, 
For digital engagement of any kind to be successful, there are three essential factors, and all three have to be in place for engagement to be effective and sustainable. They are motivation, ideally positive, access to a computer and broadband, and skills. So many government-funded initiatives address one or two of these, but only rarely is the whole picture recognised and addressed. This model certainly applies to the use of technology for the democratic process and applies to adults as well as to young people." Unquote. These are wise words which I'm confident that the Digital Democracy Commission will take to heart as it reaches its conclusions. When those reflections, ladies and gentlemen, and recommendations are published, I sincerely hope that they will lead to further refinement based upon the comments of other legislatures. It is only by such collaboration and by a willingness to share best practice that we will all obtain the optimal outcomes for our own democracies. I very much doubt that there is a one-size-fits-all solution out there, but I do believe that the solutions will have certain similarities in many cases. We shall see. In all of this, moving towards the end of my remarks, let me tell you I am an optimist. This is due to experience as well as to inclination. Democracy is a flexible creature. It can evolve in many positive directions. If we are determined to be as flexible as well, then we can reconnect parliament and politics with the public, and we can raise the quality as well as the quantity of our democratic discourse. Change is our friend. It is emphatically not to be feared. It should be embraced enthusiastically. That is my objective. Moreover, such change, if I may very politely say so, but with some earnestness of intent, it should be embraced without undue delay. I referenced earlier the upcoming 750th anniversary of our parliament in the United Kingdom and the 800th anniversary upcoming of the Magna Carta. There is a certain irony, I hope I say this with due self-deprecation, about the fact that it will be only in 2015 that we shall open adjacent to Parliament an education centre, high-tech, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, forward-looking, call it what you like, which will chart for the benefit of tens if not hundreds of thousands in the future of young people and others the journey to rights and representation in the United Kingdom. I'm absolutely passionate about the establishment of that education centre, which was in our budget as a proposal for years, but nothing had happened. And I was hell-bent, I confess, on establishing that facility, which is a progressive project and will be in the interests of reaching out to our citizens. But these things do have to be driven Otherwise, nothing happens. I don't think anybody could say that we have been hasty or that we have progressed at an excessive pace in the establishment of this prospective facility. I'm very much hoping that we'll have a sort of soft opening in March 2015 and then a full-scale opening a couple of months later. But boy, oh boy, have we taken our time. I hope in relation to technology we'll see the merits of embracing change enthusiastically and soon. And of course, there is another imperative, Madam Speaker, about doing so, and that is that if we don't, to go back to an expression I used earlier, we shall simply be running very fast to stand still, or dare I say it, we shall be running very fast to go backwards a little less slowly. And that simply isn't good enough. So sure, there must be dialogue. Sure, there must be consultation. Sure, there must be a recognition of the fact of the existence and legitimacy of different opinions. But we have in a democratic way to try to reach some conclusions as institutions, as parliaments, and then to progress them. In this, I confess, I am heartened by many aspects of the recent referendum campaign in Scotland. 
because the voters were engaged as rarely before on a matter which evidently mattered to them, the use of new social media to motivate and to mobilize the electorate, ladies and gentlemen, was striking. The level of voter registration was vast and the turnout at almost 85% was the highest for any ballot in Britain since 1918 and without the catalyst of compulsion. If politics is dead, as it is sometimes fashionable in some quarters to state, then it involves a strangely intense afterlife. Democracy in Scotland was certainly not a mere sham. Neither is it in Australia. It is as vibrant as so much else is in this amazing country of yours. It has been an honor to have the opportunity to speak to you, and it will be an honor in the course of my visit, I'm sure, to discover so much from you. Democracy is in our mutual DNA. Let us celebrate it. Thank you very much. Well, can I thank the, the sp Speaker Burko very much for that provoking and thought-provoking um, dissertation. Can I say, as the guest of, at this Guest of Parliament lecture, uh, it is designed that people can think in new paths. And uh, we are going to have the opportunity for uh, questions. And I'm also very pleased to tell you that we do have a Twitter feed. Uh, and we are being telecast around the building. So we are plugged into the digital age, if you like, uh, in this lecture tonight. Uh, with regard to the Twitter feed, we, we might take some questions from that, uh, but I might vet them. Um, uh, but in the meantime, those people who are um, p uh, present in person will have the opportunity to ask any question that they might like uh, of the speaker, and I would invite those questions now. And going to the microphone is the way to do it. Thank you. My name's Diana Ferry. Thank you so much for such an entertaining and thought-provoking talk. Um, I just wondered if you could talk about what the British government is doing online to encourage its citizens to engage with government online. I think you, um, the British government's taking a very innovative approach where you should be able to get to a government service within three clicks. And I just wondered if what your review is looking at at the moment is building on that or uh, how it sort of takes that, that representative democracy um, forward in terms of access to government services online. Would you like to sit or would you like to come back up here? I think perhaps come back up I'd here. Probably, on account of my shortness, I should probably come back here. <laughs> OK, Diane, well, thank you very much indeed for that question. Yes, I haven't studied very closely the detail of government operations, but it is true to say that in recent years, most government departments have prided themselves on far more online consultation and somewhat readier access for the public to the facts about the services that that government department provides. I think it's still pretty much work in progress. And I don't say that in any pejorative or grudging spirit, but I still have the sense from the people who are contributing to our consultation that it's harder work in respect of some departments than others to get a point of view across or even to access and to distill into the essence of what concerns the individual citizen, the data presented by a government department is not necessarily possible for people to dig very deep. There will be a certain limited amount of information, but the attempt is made by a citizen to get information, for example, from a government website, but is not really a terribly interactive process in most cases. So, I'm sure some government departments will say they're doing relatively well, and certainly the Cabinet Office should be in the lead, partly because it is responsible for some of these matters and because it's a coordinating function in respect of government policy. 
but I don't have a sense that there has been, to be honest, a great transformation as yet. So far as Parliament is concerned, therefore, will we be willing to look at and learn from some of what government departments do? Yes, I think that we will. But I think that there is a pretty huge task for Parliament, which includes the accessibility of all of our own material and how people can get access to it. It's often quite difficult to penetrate. It's difficult to get behind the headlines or the straightforward presentation by the House of its own facts, its own historical records, its own Hansard reports and so on. You know, I think that we probably need to explore how, for an interested citizen, a dialogue can take place which releases much more, which should, after all, by default, be regarded as the property of the public. That should be the default assumption that it is the public's right to know, unless there is a peculiarly compelling reason why he or she should not do so. So, you know, I think that we've got to be pretty inventive and creative. I'm not sure that just matching what individual government departments are doing at the moment will be enough. And I would just make the point that in establishing this commission, I was keen to get on with it because I thought that if I were to ask for a speaker's conference, that could well be quite a protracted process. It may seem a curious thing, ladies and gentlemen, but in the United Kingdom, a speaker's conference takes place in practice at the behest of the government. And it can take quite a while to get it established. And if, for whatever reason, the government isn't particularly keen on the idea, well, then you can't really go ahead with it. So I decided, well, I won't go through that formal structure. I will simply establish a speaker's commission. So we're very happy to receive evidence from the government and from political parties and interested citizens. But I think that we're interested to learn what other parliaments are doing. I think we're very interested to hear from the private sector. And I think we're particularly keen to hear what a lot of the more active and high-tech civil society organisations themselves are doing. So will we learn from government? Yes, but I think we'll learn from quite a lot of other people. Yes, gentlemen. You mentioned the level of public disaffection and the disengagement between citizens and, <coughs> and the formal uh, system. But uh, the, the main ideas you mentioned were electronic voting in the parliament and electronic voting by citizens. I wonder if you could, if it's too early, to share some of the perhaps more radical ideas for uh, bridging that gap between the people and the formal structure. I think it is probably too early to go into the specifics of our recommendations for the simple reason that we haven't yet drafted them. We have been taking evidence since effectively February, having crowdsourced our terms of reference. And so I don't think I can really talk about the specifics. I can certainly say that on the matters that I've mentioned, which are quite substantial issues, there will be powerful evidence, probably both ways. I confess, by the way, that you know I'm very much open to the idea of change, but I'm conscious of my own role. It's not for me to seek to impose it. You know, if you ask me, am I basically a reformer on these matters or someone who favours the status quo, the answer is I'm a reformer. I would like to see some of these things changed because I think that our politics could operate more efficiently and effectively and perhaps more inclusively if we were to go down the route of reform. I don't think I can go into the details of specific recommendations at this stage. And I also would want to say, and perhaps I didn't make this point clearly enough, that the attempt to tackle disengagement through digital means is by no means thought to be some sort of panacea, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not making the mistake of thinking, well, you know, if only we can upskill ourselves technologically, well, then we will tackle the demographic deficit. No, I, I don't think that. I think you are having to pursue several different approaches in parallel with each other. I mean, you know, I could deliver a whole lecture on the subject of why the level of public trust in politicians and the political process is as low as it is. I think there are all sorts of reasons, and I, I won't bore you with them, but I, I think one reason why, over the last few decades, Parliament has been held in low esteem, and it is only one reason, but it's quite an important one, is that people have come to think that Parliament is not effective, is not effective 
in representing them or in delivering what they want. They may well like its symbolism. They might enjoy its architecture. They might be intrigued by its history, but they're not convinced of its effectiveness. And very specifically, I think in a consumer age in which very readily at the deployment of a mouse, people can order the meal, the book, the film, the CD, the DVD, the car, the holiday, the list continues, of their choice, there is a sense of disconnect that people don't feel that they're getting what they want. Now, that to some extent will persist as a problem because the modalities of politics are different from the modalities of the marketplace. Some problems are intractable and some problems, if they're soluble at all, are soluble only in part or only over a substantial period. So I don't say that we'll ever get a complete solution, but I think that people feel Parliament is not particularly effective, or until relatively recently, it's been much less effective than it needs to be. And I think specifically also that there was a very, very strongly held view in the UK that Parliament just rubber stamped what the government wanted. One of my missions over the last five years as Speaker, apart from opening up Parliament to the public in a way I've tried on a significant scale already to do, one of my main missions has been to try to make Parliament a more scrutinising, demanding, insistent, challenging, lively and disputatious assembly because the vast majority of MPs are not ministers. We don't have the situation in the United States where there's a separation of powers. There isn't a separation of powers, of course, in the UK. And ministers do sit in Parliament. There are only about 70 or 80 ministers in Parliament. And in the House of Commons, there are 650 MPs. So most MPs are not ministers, and their role, apart from supporting their party in general terms, is to represent their constituents and to question, to probe, to scrutinise, to challenge, to contradict, and perhaps even from time to time to expose the failings of the executive branch. And it's because I think people have felt, well, Parliament's not really doing that, that they've lost faith in it. For all that we've still got very, very substantial reputational problems and they won't be overcome quickly, I do actually think in that respect, we are operating in a way that is more reflective of public opinion than we were. Far more issues are now getting to the floor of the chamber, partly as a result of the e-petition process and partly as a result of the fact we've got a new cadre of MPs who are very, very much more conscious of their own regular dialogue, often electronic, with their constituents. So it's not all about the Digital Democracy Commission or even all about technology. It's partly about a wider mindset and an acceptance on the part of parliamentarians, an acceptance and a recognition of what their role is. And their role is not just to vote willy-nilly with their party, as was very common in the 50s, 60s and 70s. I've got a question from Twitter <clears throat> from one of our MPs, Tim Watts, who says, has the Digital Democracy Commission heard proposals to use technology to give citizens a direct say in the business of Parliament, e.g. perhaps a modified version of private members' business in which members could debate topics proposed by online citizens? The short answer to that question is yes. I'm not sure whether it constitutes, Madam Speaker, one discrete submission, because I haven't got all of the submissions in front of me, as you can readily see. But I do know that that point has been made to us. Quite a lot of people have, either as part of a wider submission in writing or in oral evidence they have given, said, well, give us a chance to have a say in what you debate. I hinted at it a moment ago in response to the gentleman in the third row by saying that e-petitions have had an effect. I mean, I think we have to be slightly careful. You may or may not agree with me. I think we have to be slightly careful about establishing a kind of mechanistic link between what people say and what happens in the House. And my reason for saying that, I hope this doesn't strike you as elitist or wrong, we do have to be careful that we are not driven simply by the loudest activist, which individual might not be representative of the public as a whole. So I don't myself think, for example, that just because 100,000 people say 
that there must be a debate on a particular subject, that there automatically has to be a debate on that particular subject. There may well be a very good case for it to be treated of in the House, but that might not be a three-hour debate. It might be a statement by a minister. It might be a question and answer session lasting 20 minutes. So I think I would argue that where there is a substantial public demand, that should be reflected in what we do. But I think that we have to have some autonomy and some sovereignty in how it is treated in practice. And, you know, when people say, oh, well, you know, a lot of people want this or want that. What do they mean? I remember during the row about equal marriage in the United Kingdom, and, you know, I didn't vote in that matter because the Speaker doesn't vote, but I made it very clear to my constituents I was personally very supportive of equal marriage legislation. But I remember once on, I think, BBC Question Time, a woman in the audience who was very anti complaining bitterly that Parliament had ignored the views of the public in passing this legislation. And in justifying her position, she said that there had been... I think she said, if I remember rightly, 600,000 people had signed a petition objecting to the legislation. And she said, so, you know, it's absolute disgrace. Parliament's ignored us. And I thought, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. 600,000 is a lot, but 600,000 as a proportion of the electorate is actually very small. So, you know, hold on. Let's be a little bit careful here. We've got to be sure that we don't have everything driven by highly articulate and sometimes well-funded voices, but voices that don't necessarily represent the electorate as a whole. <laughs> Can I introduce uh, to you the member for Chisholm, who is a former Speaker of the House, and we'd be delighted to have you ask a question, Anna. Indeed, we do. Um, but, but, I mean, what is the hope of actually, actually embracing some of these recommendations and Parliament embracing change when we're all so steeped in our traditions and our ways? In a funny sort of way, and it does seem curious, I have a sense that change to online voting to electronic voting could well happen sooner in elections than in parliamentary votes. Now, why is that curious? Well, I suppose simply because you might think bringing about a change within one's own parliament is a simpler and perhaps quicker thing to do. And you might think, you might, it's not for me to attribute an opinion to you, that before suggesting that the electorate should conduct elections or have the chance to conduct elections in that way, we might perhaps practice what we preach and do it ourselves first. But actually, I've got a sort of feeling that it will happen in elections. I'm generally against sort of theories of inevitability, and certainly I'm not an historical determinist or anything. It's just that I think that the logic points in the direction of the opportunity to vote electronically, because that's what it is. It's not an insistence on doing so, it's an opportunity to do so. We're not saying nobody shall vote by using a ballot paper and a pencil. We are thinking in terms of the chance that people should have to vote electronically if they so wish, as they, as I say, do to the tune of a quarter of the population in Estonia. Of course, considerations of the integrity of the ballot are absolutely critical. There are people who tell me, well, the technology exists to give very strong assurance on that point, and that is obviously essential, and certainly they're very convinced of the integrity of the ballot under these arrangements in Estonia. But that, I think, might come sooner, and it may well be that it takes longer to get a change in Parliament itself in very broad terms, and it is a very, very broad brush differentiation. I would say I think there's a generational divide. I think younger members are more open to the idea of change, and some of our long-serving colleagues, and I treat them and their views with respect. 
are much less enthusiastic. And to be fair, some of them say, well, they think that there is a merit in going through the division lobby and the opportunity for discourse that this affords and so on. And I do understand that argument. There is a counter argument that says the wider consideration of efficiency would suggest that it's not a good idea to spend a quarter of an hour over each vote. But I think online voting in elections will come. I'm not saying exactly when it will come, because I don't know, but I think it will come. And I think eventually there may well be a change in Parliament. But if you're asking me, do I think it's going to happen a week next Tuesday, I think I would say no. Can I say we have to wrap up by half past six. But I would like to say that we've uh, received a, a follow-up question that came in on the um, uh, e-petitions. Um, which said, the UK has managed e-petitions engagement with the community. Tell us about the benefits of that engagement. And that comes from Gary Gordon on Twitter. Uh, and Sarah Logan has asked, how does the UK manage community expectations and cynicism regarding social media engagement? Now, um, in fairness to the live audience, yes. uh, perhaps if um, one last person could ask a question, and if you could in, in in Gary, incorporate uh, some comments on those two, uh, I think that would be a lovely way to wind up. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chaba Nicolini. I'm visiting from Montreal, Canada, and I'm a visiting professor at the ANU Center for European Studies. Thank I would you. like to ask you, uh, Mr. Speaker, about the genesis uh, of the commission of the, um, of the, the digital diplomacy, uh, digital democracy commission itself uh, that you formed. It almost seems counterintuitive to me that the initiative itself didn't come from the digital constituency, so to speak, from the citizenry at large. Uh, on the one hand, it's um, extremely comforting to see that the political establishment that you represent actually thinks very proactively and reaches a step forward uh, trying to think about the future of, uh, of British democracy. But what was the catalyst that prompted you, the reformer, to actually make this very important step? The answer to that is that I'd thought for some time that we were somewhat behind the curve and I'd been quite struck, particularly when I met young people around the country speaking to universities or in some cases going to schools, by the fact that there was a completely different lexicon they were using. And by the way, I mentioned in that context that I myself have traditionally been something of a technophobe. I'm not proud of that at all, and I'm trying to get into the 20th century in the hope that I might eventually progress to the 21st. But I'm not proud of that, and I think that it was really meeting quite a lot of young people that first made me think, gosh, we need to change. Some contact with a very small number, to be honest, of parliamentarians who themselves have got a very forward-looking and progressive approach to the use of technology and who have very, very, very much more sort of real-time access to their constituents than used to be the case, that made me think, gosh, they're onto something here. They're not operating in the traditional way that MPs operated at all. And, and they seem to be forging relationships and developing linkages in their constituencies that are probably beneficial to them and which extrapolated from and applied more widely could be useful. So those were two factors. And there was a third factor, if I'm really honest about it, and that is that I have a guy working with me called Tim Hames, who, who doesn't work with me full time, but he works in the private sector, but he does a variety of things with me. He's by background a, an academic and a former senior journalist on The Times, and he now works, as I say, in the private sector, a multi-talented guy. And he certainly said to me, you know, I think taking your own speakership forward where I have tried to focus on a number of things that I think we can usefully modernize and reform, I think you ought to think about this element. And it was a number of conversations with him over a period of months, which caused me to think, well, look, there's no point in hanging around waiting for someone else to do something, which probably won't happen or will happen over too long a period. Let's just get on with it. And so I said to myself, well, what can I do? Answer, I can set up a commission. I've drawn in some parliamentary colleagues to take part, but they are a minority. I've got a Labour member called Meg Hillier, who represents Tech City in Hackney in East London, and a Conservative MP called Robert Halfon, who's very 
technology friendly and they serve on it, but there's a majority of people on the Digital Democracy Commission who are not MPs, who are not politicians, a mixture of academics and uh, people from civil society, young people and so on and so forth. And so those really are the motivations. In terms of the questions that I've been asked, the benefit of e-petition engagement with the community, what's the benefit of that engagement? Well, I think that the answer, very simply put, is that we get much more quickly and in more concerted and explicit and transparent form through e-petitions a representation of what people think we should be debating or should be legislating. And is that a benefit? Yes, I think it is. It means that the communication that we're getting is much less diffuse. We can all see it. It's up there in a way that, you know, if we were just dealing with our sort of collective snail mail post bags, wouldn't so graphically illustrate what the public are thinking or demanding or saying. So I think my key point there would be that the benefit is a transparent representation of what people are thinking at a particular time. It doesn't mean it's necessarily 100% right. It doesn't mean it should automatically inform either our immediate policy or our medium or long-term policy, but it does perhaps suggest that if we are not to be in a dialogue with the deaf or hard of hearing with the electorate, we should at least be wanting to consider what they are saying, please consider. <laughs> Put very simply, that's the benefit. And how do we manage expectations, community expectations and cynicism regarding social media engagement? Well, I think there are two things here. First of all, I hinted earlier that I think that we've got to be candid with people about what we're saying, although sometimes there is a danger that people hear only what they want to hear, but we should be careful not to say or give the impression of saying, if 100,000 people want X policy, X policy is gonna happen. We're not saying that at all. What we're saying is if a large volume of people want, large body of people want a particular subject to be considered by parliament, then we will take that seriously. It doesn't necessarily mean it will be a full day debate. It might be a Q and A, it might be a ministerial statement, it might be a committee looking at something. So, you know, I think that we should probably be careful not to over promise. And I suppose the second point is, you know, how do people use social media themselves? There, I think probably I ought to be rather more cautious. I am not myself on Twitter. I've thought about it. I haven't gone on, principally because I just don't think that I would do it much myself, the sheer load of stuff that one has to do. I'm not sure that I would really do it that much myself. I'm not personally keen on the idea of going on Twitter and then having a sort of Twitter site that's effectively managed by someone else. And I suppose the only point I would make, I'm not making a particular point about any individual from any particular political party at all. On the subject of cynicism, I think sometimes people feel that people in public life who are engaged in social media activity are engaged in it in a rather sort of formulaic and perhaps a propagandistic way rather than a conversational way. And my sense is that the preferred culture of the modern use of social media by its better practitioners is for conversation rather than for propaganda. Well, ladies and gentlemen, those on Twitter and those uh, viewing on our channel, I think uh, 115, can I say I think we've been very fortunate this evening to have had such um, a learned dissertation from Speaker Burko, and I'm sure that we all await the report that comes down uh, in 2015 to coincide with the 750th anniversary of Simon de Montfort, if my memory serves me, Absolutely. Parliament. Um, and show uh, the forward path uh, that uh, the Commission is obviously headed for, uh, will spark within us uh, questions as well. I think those of us who've been interested in the way um, social media and indeed the digital world is developing is this. I read an article that said the most popular birthday present for two-year-olds is now an iPad. Now that made me think, had I been behind the eight ball, because 
My granddaughter, who's about to be seven, didn't get hers till she was four. <laughs> However, uh, I, I think the usage of social media, and you've just sparked our imaginations, I think, Speaker, the, uh, is evolving. I don't think we know where it's going to go and where it's going to end up. Uh, it's a movable feast and we simply have to adapt to it. Uh, here, I take uh, the uh, attitude that people can use it in the chamber, but they're still bound by the same standing orders. Yes. Uh, we're investigating usages of cloud technology, of, use of using the cloud uh, as a method of giving greater access to people um, of information that doesn't necessarily have to be held in some great repository of, of uh, only those who are creating it or having access to it needs to be. But then the question arises, if you put too much in the cloud, what does that do? So there are many questions about privacy, interaction of uh, digital technology, I think that are yet to even surface, but I will be reading your report uh, with great expectations. Um, I think I agree with you that probably electronic voting for the populace is more likely than in the parliament. And I think I have great sympathy for backbenchers who wish to get ministers, can't get in the front door of an office, but boy, you can bag them in a division. <laughs> so I'd simply like to say we're very grateful for your coming and being uh, our guest uh, at this lecture this evening. I'm sure that people have uh, enjoyed the content and the delivery. And would you all please join with me in the usual way in saying thank you very much for being with us. <laughs>